All right, good morning, everybody. We are stepping back into the world of decimals, get ready for math lesson 109. Today, we're talking about multiplying decimal numbers. So, the big thing to know when you're multiplying decimal numbers, don't treat it like adding or subtracting. You don't line up at the decimal point. First step, multiply exactly the same as if you were multiplying whole numbers. Then you want to count the total number of decimal numbers in the problem. Then you want to move the decimal point in the answer that many places to the left. And let's take a look right here at this example. So I don't have to pin a decimal point on the end of 36 like I do when I'm adding or subtracting. I'm just going to go 36 times 5 tenths. I'm not even going to worry about the decimal point until the very end. 5 times 6 is 30, so I'm going to write down my 0. I'm going to go ahead and carry that 3, right? Then I'm going to go 5 times 3 is 15, plus the 3 more. That's going to give us 18, right? We only worry about the decimal point at the very end. So now, what's the total number of decimal digits I have in the whole problem? Only one. That five is the only number behind a decimal point, right? So I'm going to go ahead and move the decimal point over one place to the left. And I ended up with 18 and 0 tenths. But what did we remember? about simplifying decimal numbers. I don't need to have 18 and 0 tenths. I can just call that plain old 18. So this is a little chart they devised to help you remember because once we start multiplying decimals, it's sometimes easy to get it mixed up between what we have to do when we add or subtract. And I know on today's lesson, they're going to want you to copy this down. Make it take up one whole square of your lesson. You'll find it on page 719 of your book. And they're talking about the different operations. Either you add or subtract. When you add or subtract, you line up the decimal points, right? If one number is written with a decimal point, they all must be written with a decimal point so we can line up the decimals. The operation when you multiply, your memory cue is to multiply and then count. If I have two numbers behind a decimal point in the problem, I need two numbers behind a decimal point in the answer because I'm going to move the decimal point over two places, right? And you also may need to place a decimal point at the end of whole numbers and fill in empty places with zeros. Remember, we do that when we add or subtract decimals. Okay, let's go on and see how this is going to work when we multiply. So starting off right now, I have 3 and 6 tenths multiplied by 5 tenths, right? It just happened to work out this way that my decimal points were lined up, but I don't have to make any special effort. So let's start off right now. I'm just going to think of it as 36 times 5. 5 times 6 is 30. This looks awful familiar, what we were doing on that other page, right? I'm going to carry my 3. 5 times 3 is 15, plus the 3 we carried. That's 18. So I have 180, but now i got to go ahead and count the total number of decimal digits in the problem, right? So I'm going to move the decimal point over one place, two places, and right now it looks like it's saying 1 and 80 hundredths. But do I really need that zero on the end? Remember what we said about simplifying decimal numbers? So I ended up with just one and eight tenths. So it doesn't really matter what way the book might possibly be lining up the problem. 
because remember we have the commutative property in multiplication. When you're setting up the problem, my advice is use whatever number has the most digits for the top. If I try multiplying like this, it might get a little confusing for some people. Six tenths has two digits, I'd leave him on top. Then go and multiply by three. So I'm starting off with six tenths times three. We're not even worried about the decimal point. Just think of them as six times three. Well, I should know that. Six times three, that's 18, right? How many total numbers behind a decimal point do I have in the problem? One, right? So I'm going to go ahead and move my decimal point over one place in my answer. And you don't have to go and make those little moves. I'm just going to show you how it works. If you have one number behind the decimal point in a problem, you need one number behind a decimal point in the answer. If you didn't reduce and erase any zeros. So here I have 12 hundredths times 1 and 2 tenths. I'm not even going to worry about my decimal points right now. Think of it as 12 times 12. Hopefully you know 12 times 12 is going to give you a grand total of 144, right? Then I want to take a look at how many total numbers behind the decimal point I have in the problem. Looks to me like I have three digits behind the decimal point, so I'm going to have to go ahead and move my decimal point over one, two, three places. And remember, when we're writing decimal numbers, if you don't have any value in your ones place, go ahead and write in a zero. Also, don't leave little messy marks like this. That makes it awful tough to correct, so if you are doing that, make sure to erase it. So I have a total answer of 144 thousandths. So check out this one now. We have to go and compare fractions and decimals. Can you do it without having to do any math on it? If not, feel free to multiply. 3 times 3 would be 9. Denominator times denominator, 10 times 10. Hey, that is going to give you 100, right? So I have a final fraction answer here of 9 hundredths. Well, 3 times 3 would also be 9. And I have two numbers behind a decimal point, two decimal numbers. So I would have to go and move my decimal point over two places. So I jump over one number. Uh-oh. What do I do now? I have nothing here to jump. Well, what digit is worth nothing? A zero is worth nothing, right? We've been saying that for a long time. So I'm going to go ahead and jump over another one, and my decimal point ends up right there. I'm going to go ahead and clean up my little messy jump lines, and I don't have a value in my one spot, so I want to go and put in a zero. So I have nine hundredths compared to 0 0.09. This is why it's imperative you actually know how to say the name of the numbers correctly. This is also nine hundredths. That's going to be equal. Hopefully you were able to look right at the beginning and say 3 tenths times 3 tenths compared to 3 tenths times 3 tenths. It would save you a whole lot of time, right? So what is the area of this square? Remember, area is length times width. So let's go ahead and get it set up. Now that I have the length of 8 tenths times the width of 8 tenths, just go ahead and think of it. What is 8 times 8? Well, 8 times 8 is 64. But 
But now I have to go ahead and think how many total numbers behind the decimal point do I have in the problem? I have two digits behind the decimal point in the problem. I better go and jump my decimal point over two in the answer. So the decimal point is going to land right here. I got a couple other things to do. I have no value in the ones place, so I better go ahead and add my zero, right? And do not leave messy jump lines like this. This is just done for your benefit. So if you do write them in, make sure to erase them. So my final answer is 64 hundredths, but this is an area problem, so don't forget the most important part, to label it square centimeters, since this is an area problem. Check out this one. What is the perimeter of the square? We're still dealing with the square that is 8 tenths of a centimeter on each side. And you might be thinking, oh, Mr. Hines, we add when we go and find a perimeter, right? We have to add all the sides, but this is a square. So all four sides are equal. Yeah, I could go and add each side four times, or I could go ahead and multiply by four, right? Don't even worry about the decimal point until the very end. Four times eight, that is 32, right? Now we have to go and take a look. What's the total number of decimal digits I have in the problem? Only one, right? So my invisible decimal point is right at the end. If I don't have one showing, I'm going to jump over one number, and I end up with three and two tenths, right? But again, we're getting a little bit sloppy. If this is a perimeter problem, we don't have to label it cubed or squared, but we do want to put in cm for centimeters. Three and two tenths of a centimeter. And that, my friends, is the end. You're probably going to want a scratch piece of paper for this creative quiz, and good luck. <laughs>